Thank you, Linda. Welcome, everyone. Uh, today's webinar is an early preview of the new features in C2.0, the new infrastructure for managing, sharing, curating, preserving, and publishing data. My name is Anna Ovchinyukova. I'm SEED's user education and support specialist. And Jim Myers, SEED's co-PI and chief architect, is here with us today as well to help facilitate today's webinar and answer questions. Uh, speaking about questions, uh, we strongly encourage you to ask questions, so please type those into the question field. Uh, we'll pause during the presentation to check for questions, and then uh, we'll leave a good amount of time at the end to address those, as Linda mentioned. Uh, we are very interested in your uh, feedback, your comments, your general impressions on what you see today, what features you like uh, and don't like, and if there's anything we could improve. So please share your thoughts with us uh, on what you see today. So uh, let's begin. Um, on your screen, uh, you see uh, SEED's main website, uh, seeddata.net, uh, where you can find uh, a lot of useful information about the project, such as uh, features overview, um, and uh, news and events, and help resources. For those of you who are unfamiliar uh, with SEED, uh, we are an NSF-sponsored project, which was created as part of NSF DataNet program. SEED provides secure, hosted, access-controlled, uh, self-managed project spaces in which teams and individual researchers can incrementally develop da data collections and then submit uh, their data for publication and long-term preservation uh, using SEED uh, publication services. Project is led by um, principal investigator uh, Margaret Hedstrom at the University of Michigan and three co-PIs, uh, Praveen Kumar, a researcher and professor at the uh, University of Illinois, uh, Jim Myers, who, who is with us today, uh, uh, CIS chief architect and uh, research investigator at the University of Michigan. Uh, Beth Blail, uh, a professor and uh, a director of Data to Insight Center at the Indiana U University. Uh, seed services are operated by a team spanning multiple institutions at the University of Michigan, University of Illinois, and Indiana University. I'm going to briefly draw your attention to the uh, publications and presentations page on the SEED website under the About tab. After today's presentation, I'm going to post a recording of today's um, webinar uh, to this page. And uh, we're going to be updating the help section on the SEED website uh, with FAQs and video tutorials pertaining to the, to the 2.0 platform. So if you are a SEED update subscriber, you'll hear from us uh, when we make these updates to the website. And if you are not and would like to subscribe, it's very easy to do uh, by uh, going to this button on the news and events page on the SEED website, or there is a link in the footer uh, to subscribe to SEED updates, uh, which takes you to the same subscription form here. Um, so SEED is uh, uh, operating currently uh, more than 20 live project spaces that are based on the first generation software, uh, SEED 1.5, and these project spaces can be accessed uh, through the project spaces page on the SEED website. So these are secure uh, access control project spaces and groups like SAN uh, been increasingly active in um, publishing data so they can uh, cite them and make them uh, available to the community. And this real world um, uh, use has been really critical to the continuing advancement and development in SEED. And that's actually what led to the uh, design of the 2.0 capabilities. Um, but one thing I want to mention here, while we are very excited about the upcoming 2.0, the current version of um, uh, SEED services, SEED 1.5, is active and supported and is a great option for anyone who is uh, in need of publishing data, who works with uh, large numbers of files, uh, many different types of files, um, and with rich metadata. Uh, so if you're interested in uh, starting a project with SEED uh, now, you certainly can do so, and please let us know, uh, and we can provide you more information about uh, the current environment and help you to get started. Uh, but uh, today I'm going to switch to the main focus of uh, today's webinar, and next to the um, 
test side of the 2.0 beta. Uh, the new 2.0 platform is designed to better support curation and publication in parallel with research activities. So again, you should expect all basic features for adding, organizing, sharing, and annotating uh, data over time with a, a custom uh, a set of a community and uh, 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 basically custom uh, metadata vocabularies. Uh, but C2.0 offers some really exciting new features, including a modern and responsive interface and uh, a highly scalable uh, architecture that makes it um, uh, so much easier uh, to create project spaces, to share your content across multiple spaces. And for publication uh, purposes, for publishing your data, uh, C2.0 provides an interactive staging area where you can uh, make final adjustments to your data, select a repository, and uh, track the process of the uh, publication, uh, of your publication process. Um, as you will see, uh, this beta version is still work in progress. Uh, this is an early preview, and not everything works as smoothly as we would like, but we are excited to show you some really cool features today uh, that we are preparing to roll out for you to use later this spring. Uh, before we go uh, further, uh, I would like to mention some key new aspects of the 2.0 platform. Uh, first, uh, 2.0 utilizes a slightly uh, different content model. Um, in 1.5, users can create uh, collections uh, and publish collections. In 2.0, we switch to a data set as a, a aggregation of files, so data set can have more than one file, and data set now is a publishable object in 2.0. So we made that change to uh, get closer to, uh, to the way people actually uh, think and talk about uh, an aggregation of files. Um, and uh, in the, uh, another thing, in the current 1.5 environment, project spaces are separate virtual machines with uh, distinct URLs. Uh, and uh, if you work uh, in multiple project spaces in 1.5 currently, you have to log in into uh, uh, each project space separately. We made some really great improvements in this area in 2.0. Uh, and while 2.0 project spaces are still uh, access controlled and customizable, uh, they share one common uh, scalable database and file storage. So, and that means that you have only one login across all project spaces. Uh, and that makes uh, uh, it so much e easier to create uh, project spaces and easier to share content and follow updates across um, multiple project spaces. So I'm going to log in here. And it takes me to this next item that I wanted to highlight as a new uh, feature. And uh, those are the personalized um, uh, home pages like uh, mine that you see on your screen. Um, and this uh, uh, new uh, uh, item um, in 2.0 allows me to quickly see my latest events, uh, my latest data sets and collections, and my spaces. Um, this area is still being tweaked, and uh, we are still deciding how much information to show you in what order. So if you have any inputs, uh, any great ideas, please let, it, let us know. Um, and. Um, the next thing I wanted to show you, uh, the new thing in 2.0, is the new way to create project spaces, uh, as I mentioned. Um, to create uh, or start a new project space in 2.0, I simply need to click on this Create button. And I can give my a new project space a name, a description, a link, uh, uh, any uh, external uh, sites like, uh, you know, I did for Seed, I'll show you in a second. I linked um, a main Seed website here and some social media sites. I can customize um, my space with a, a logo and custom banner. Uh, to save time, uh, I wanted to show you um, a space that I already created for this webinar. Uh, to let you see what it's going to look like. Uh, so this is my uh, project space uh, for today's webinar with a logo and custom uh, header. Um, so the difference here is 
pretty significant. Um, in 1.5, you uh, have to contact uh, a seed and a request a project space to be set up for you. Uh, and uh, we would have to decide how much space you need, and uh, uh, the setup would take a little bit of time. Um, here, the uh, process was. Uh, literally instantaneous. Uh, you uh, give your space a name, description, you brand your space, and you can start using your space uh, immediately. Start uploading data, invite users, share your content, uh, create collections to better organize your space. Um, and uh, if you're ready, you can actually even go ahead and uh, start publishing your data. Um, so again, as you see here uh, uh, on my project space, I added some uh, uh, data sets here. Uh, and in 2.0, just as you can do now in 1.5, you can upload practically any type of data and work with type-specific previews uh, without having to download your data back into your computer to see what those files are. And that includes maps and graphs and uh, uh, zoomable images, playable videos, uh, tabular spreadsheets and presentations, uh, uh, documents uh, to show you some examples. Uh, so this is a data set that has more than one file uh, in it. Um, so that's what it looks uh, if I go uh, to a file level. Uh, or um, I also have some uh, geospatial data here. And another example, um, I have a playable, uh, playable uh, video to show you. A bit loud, uh, okay. And let's see, uh, and I have a, a, 3D, a 3D object example for you to look at. So um, just to de demonstrate that um, different types of data can be handled quite easily. Um, so even though uh, we still have some work left to do before 2.0 uh, is a final um, product, the thing that we would like you to come away with uh, from today's presentation is that because project spaces are uh, sharing one virtual space, you'll have one uh, account uh, across seed. This makes it very easy to work with uh, uh, across multiple uh, multiple spaces, easy to see content you have across multiple spaces, and easy to share and follow uh, content across multiple project spaces. Like uh, here, for example, I can again add my collection, um, share my collection to uh, a different space, or go into my data set and add it to a collection um, uh, in a different space and uh, as easily remove that uh, access. Uh, in terms of adding metadata, uh, things work um, uh, quite similarly uh, to how they do now in the current environment. You can add metadata describing uh, data sets as well as um, uh, uh, you can add metadata on the, on the file level as, uh, and the same with tags. So there is a place uh, for me to add metadata on the data, data set uh, level, as I already did uh, here, and add uh, tags, or I can go uh, to a file level for a specific file and add another set of uh, metadata here. Uh, as, and you can also see that there is a quite a substantial amount of uh, automatically extracted metadata that uh, our extractors uh, add to your um, um, data here. And the, the tags, uh, I can use uh, add tags again on both levels, data set and file, and use it um, to uh, navigate um, uh, across my uh, content here. For example, um, let's see, I tagged the data set that I wanted to show during today's presentation, and I can easily see them all at once uh, by using this feature. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, again, to make it uh, easy for you to collaborate with your team, uh, there are ways for you to uh, add comments uh, on a data set level. 
uh, and notes, uh, which are uh, formatted notes. Uh, and this is a new uh, feature uh, in 2.0. And you can do the same uh, for each individual file. You can add uh, comments. I'm sorry, that's a uh, uh, long uh, automatic extract metadata here. Um, and we can close it. Same with notes. Um, so let's say. Um, I'm ready uh, to publish my data. So uh, we're ex actually especially excited to show you uh, this new feature uh, in 2.0, uh, which is an uh, uh, interactive uh, staging area where you can make final adjustments to your data, select a repository using Seed's uh, matchmaker service, and submit your data set for publication. And uh, to start uh, pu publishing uh, my data set, again, data sets are the publishable objects in 2.0. Uh, to start that process, I'm going to simply click on this uh, publish button on the data sets page. And uh, by doing so, I'm creating a version of my live data, uh, which we call a curation object. I can change. Uh, name of my data set of my uh, creation object. I can select uh, which space I'm going to be publishing it in. And uh, this way I'm creating uh, my creation object and now I'm in the staging area. In the staging area I can continue to work with my curation object. Uh, I can review my data. I can remove uh, any files uh, that I like. Um, Generally, uh, with Seed, the expectation is that uh, your live object is already close to what you'd like to publish. Uh, and it has some metadata that you've added over time. But in 2.0, you now have this new way to make final changes, such as adding a new metadata, metadata field that perhaps is required by a repository you want to publish to. And, um, uh, also, in staging area, you can now uh, specify preferences for publishing your data, and I'm going to show it, uh, show show you how to do it in a moment. Um, but before we go further, I wanted to mention that uh, the live data set uh, will remain unaffected by changes that I make uh, here in the staging area, and I can always go back to my live object for any uh, reference. Um, and I can uh, continue working on my live uh, object, make additional changes, add more data, uh, uh, add more metadata, and it will not affect my uh, curation object. The same way I can add um, additional metadata terms, uh, for example, oh, I've been already um, uh, adding some here, I can use this uh, string. Um, and as you can see, this uh, particular metadata uh, I probably don't want to keep it uh, as part of my li live object, but this is uh, very relevant to this particular version. Um, so when I'm uh, satisfied with the changes that I'm, uh, I've made to, the, to my creation object, I can move on to the second step. Um, and this is what I wanted to point out, uh, bring your attention to this links at the top. There are three main steps uh, in the staging area. Uh, the one that we're currently on, the, uh, the place where you added the metadata. The, the second one is where you select a repository. And the last one, uh, the third one, is where you actually submit your uh, curation object uh, for publication to uh, a chosen repository. Uh, so let's say I'm, I'm good here and I'm going to move to the second uh, step to select repository. Um, at this moment, uh, the staging area invokes uh, requests to the seed matchmaker service to recommend uh, appropriate repositories for archiving my data set. The matchmaker displays a list of recommended uh, or candidate repositories rank, ranked by best fit metric and provides reasons why the data set would or would not meet the requirements of a given repository. Uh, also on this page, I can enter my repository preferences for publishing my data set. Um, so I can indicate some, something uh, different here and update my results. 
uh, or I can go back to edit my data, da my metadata. Uh, maybe I am gonna add uh, a contact here. Uh, perhaps it's required. Um, and go back to uh, select repository. And each time I do this, the matchmaker updates my list of candidate repositories. Um, this sample list of uh, candidate repositories includes the ICPSR repository at the University of Michigan, uh, SEED National Data Service uh, Labs publisher, IDEALS, um, and the IU Cloud at the uh, Indiana University. IDEALS are, uh, this is the University of Illinois. Uh, so for demonstration purposes, uh, let's say um, I'm satisfied with all my changes and uh, I would like to select uh, see National Data Service Labs Publisher as my target repository. So uh, I select uh, my repository and now I can click uh, the submit for publication, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, submit to repository uh, button uh, and now I get a summary. Uh, where I may still need to uh, complete some steps such as in this particular case uh, I'm asked to acknowledge certain confidentiality rules and uh, with that uh, I can complete my uh, process of submitting uh, this data set for publication. Um, so obviously uh, there could be some additional steps that uh, uh, could be involved in uh, submitting uh, your uh, data for publication. Uh, SEED, by the way, will not prevent you uh, from submitting um, your data, your data set to a repository even though not all the rep uh, rep uh, repository's requirements are met. But this could only uh, also mean that you uh, uh, would be required to talk to curators of that uh, repository and maybe follow some additional instructions that they uh, they will send you. So as you can see, uh, SEED's publication process can literally be initiated with a push of a button and uh, depending on the repository chosen, be completed in an entirely uh, automated workflow. And at any time, I can go back to the staging area to monitor uh, the progress uh, of my uh, publication. And depending on the, on the chosen repository, there could be some additional steps, as I mentioned. Uh, to complete the process. Uh, for example, chosen repository may require some additional metadata uh, or any additional uh, steps could be involved and you can return to this staging area to complete those additional requirements and again monitor the, the process. Um, for example, um, uh, you can come back here and see uh, the updates and the repositories can also uh, add uh, additional uh, instructions for you here in the staging area or they could also send you emails with those. So uh, once your data has been published you can see uh, details of your publication on the publications landing page such as uh, this one. I know it's a simple example um, but it shows you uh, the de details that you can expect to see uh, on the landing page of your publication which is the DOI uh, for citing your data, uh, any metadata that you published your data with, uh, the content and uh, uh, visitors of your landing page can download any part of it. Um, there's also a link to the uh, live um, uh, object uh, and uh, normally it would be locked uh, behind the login. Um, so users would have to request access to see your live data. Um, so, uh, just a quickly, since I mentioned requests, uh, I can show you how this would look like. Uh, I have a request here on my home page for access to my space, uh, and I would uh, address uh, this by going to the uh, Manage Users section to assign roles and accept or reject um, uh, that access request as well as manage users and invite external users to my space. Um, so let's uh, revisit here the staging area. 
where you can go back and monitor the publication process. Um, so this uh, concludes what we wanted to show you today as an introductory preview of new features um, coming up in SEED's next uh, version of data services. Um, as I said before, some of this is still work in progress, uh, but in terms of overall architecture and the new look and feel, we hope that you were uh, able to see that 2.0 has uh, a lot of core functionality that SEED's current services uh, provide and uh, also add some key exciting uh, improvements such as a uh, quick and easy way to access project spaces, streamlined uh, and automated publication process uh, using the staging area with a matchmaker to help with repository selection. Um, and uh, this could be maybe a good uh, time to pause and check for questions. And I, uh, I, I would like to invite Jim to uh, join the discussion. Okay, so. I'm here. Um, I've been trying to answer as we go here a little bit in text. Um, and, and I'm in the middle of answering one more. Um, but let me, uh, let me make a couple comments to try and cover um, some of the high-level ones here. So um, there are a couple questions about um, uh, what what repositories uh, are in and out of seed, um, uh, who can use it, and uh, and then how do we compare to other services? So let me let me try and tackle those. Um, right now, Seed is an open service that anyone can use. Um, we've primarily focused in the area of sustainability science, which is our, our direct mandate from NSF to, to basically work most closely with one community. But um, a lot of that is basically that the kinds of data that you see previews and things for are time series, spatial data, um, spreadsheets, things that, that are common in this area. So we, we have better support for the types of files and sustainability than elsewhere, but um, but basically it's open beyond that. Um, we do have, uh, like everyone who's in the game at the moment here, uh, the question of, of who's going to pay for long-term storage uh, across the NSF uh, uh, universe and beyond is an open question. So uh, we have partners who are willing to basically start capturing some of that data uh, and hold it for as long as they institutionally can. And we're working with groups such as the National Data Service uh, to try and figure out longer term solutions there and so on. Um, so right now, um, again, the, the doors open. Um, we're looking for users who you know, are going to do something uh, uh, interesting, who will give us feedback, but um, if you need a DUI for a publication and you're in sustainability research, you should be able to press the button and go. Um, the repositories that we're working with right now are all uh, publishing this uh, uh, without a fee. Um, basically, uh, when we publish to Indiana, um, we've got an agreement to use a, a significant amount of uh, storage space there for the project that we're using. Um, OpenICPSR uh, coming out of Michigan is another one where the OpenICPSR is, is meant as a, an open repository for self-publishing that will accept things. Um, Ideals is another option that's based on an institutional repository at Illinois and w w trying not to overstep anybody's bounds on what their policies are. I think right now that is thought more of as uh, an example of how institutional repositories could provide publishing through seed to to uh, local researchers. So research of interest to Illinois, research involving Illinois researchers could go back into ideals. Um, and again, in, in terms of uh, uh, early stuff, I think most anybody will, um, you know, if, if the data isn't huge and there's a good reason for it, I think people will go beyond their stated policies at this point. Um, in terms of, of features, again, I, I hope what comes across for certainly people have used 1.5 um, and I hope it's coming across in the 2.0 demo here is that the, the, the thing that motivated us to start Seed was to think a lot about how things that you would normally do to curate and preserve your data and get it published at the end, how that could actually help you during active research. Um, so the idea is that putting data into Seed, you can do it incrementally over time. Um, you can get a lot of value out by 
being able to see the metadata inside files, being able to get previews of files, being able to have conversations around those files. Um, and you don't have to worry up front about whether this is good data, bad data, correct, incorrect. You just use it as a space to, to work in. And then when you publish, you can decide which subsets, what additional metadata is needed, where is it going to go, and then push out um, you know, things potentially, some of your data goes to an institution repository, your large data could go off to a national service. Um, you can basically make choices as to where to publish as you go. Um, so I think in general, um, that kind of, of, uh, of philosophy behind this has, has led to slight, you know, differences in features and feature set compared to other places, which, um, you know, many of them, A, look a lot more like a, a what we sort of deride as a form in your face where you go there, you have to add all the metadata at once and then you submit and go away um, and you get one DUI and the next time you start over again. Um, it's also made us think a lot more about features of how do we separate the data that's directly tied to a publication that you might want to publish one way, um, the larger set of raw data that you might want to publish um, separately but make available for people who are really going to dig in and try and reproduce your research, um, and how much you even then publish sort of the gray things that are, you know, your mistakes, but for historical purposes you might want to have, um, you know, some data that's that's out there for that purpose. But basically you can you can publish what you want to when you want to, um, and again, I think there's a lot of a lot of the sort of low-level features and the way you navigate, the way you look at things and see it, and the kinds of options we we provide are are, um, are because of that kind of mantra. Um, so again, we've got a lot more support than most people for uh, very large collections, very deep collections. Um, it's not just one or two files. We've got some collections that we've published have been 100,000 plus files in one collection. Um, and I think with that, I don't know if, uh, if you're uh, scanning questions as well. I was going to see a few coming in, so I was going to scan. Yeah, um, uh, I wanted to show a couple more things here um, since we've been talking about, um, um, for example, landing pages. Um, I want to highlight that there's a, a, another significant um, change in, in 2.0 with uh, uh, ORCID IDs that um, C is planning to retire the current uh, research network component in favor of making connections to ORCID and possibly uh, other profile services. ORCID is uh, being used uh, by a growing number of uh, journals to identify paper authors over their careers. So on landing pages, we actually, uh, landing pages of your publication, uh, publications, we have now a live link that is uh, connected to your uh, live ORCID ID. So that's an, another um, significant change. Um, okay, then I, I see a, a question from within our team um, reminding us to go back to the, uh, when you're publishing, again, f compared to, um, you know, 1.5. 1, 1 so a lot, a lot of this stuff, you know, we've been out working with some groups for close to three years now, and a lot of the feedback that we've gotten has gone into making 1.5 you know, usable and easier to navigate and more robust and secure than it was because people have been banging on the buttons and actually publishing things and so on. And I think that's true as well, that we've tried to take a lot of that learning from how people were trying to use it and the questions they've asked and the things they found easy and hard to go into 2.0 as well. Um, so I think that's where a lot of the features that you're hearing about today that we're, we're touting as these big main features are things that, you know, we're were hard for us to do in the old architecture. So, you know, creating your own project space, it's now a bit easy. You can go there and do it and you're up and running. Um, the other one I wanted to mention as you go through publishing, again, in, in our old system, publishing was, you know, as easy as clicking a button, but once the button was clicked, you really got no feedback about what was happening until you either got a DOI or somebody called you and said, we can't handle this because you broke a policy or we're not doing it or, you know, you're missing some metadata or something. Um, so with Duo, the idea of this, this curation area where you can make final adjustments, um, you can see some of the policies of the, the repositories and so on is, is all new and being developed, but the idea that you have a lot of uh, information about what repositories do and don't want to do, um, you get a lot of uh, um, uh, feedback from the repository as to where it is in their pipeline. So uh, some that may want to do a lot of manual steps or they're going to, you know, they're going to 
virus check, they may tell you a lot of things about what their internal processing is doing, and basically that's all available here. Um, that said, um, this GUI is a little bit new. Um, we had a couple questions around the edges of, we, we saw $300 there, is that the standard fee? Um, right now, those are just examples of preferences that could be in. Um, nobody's charging money for any of the things that we publish at the moment, but we're anticipating that differences in the license that you would want, um, whether you want uh, you know, some repositories, um, ICPSR is well known for really providing a lot of human expertise and curation for the main ICPR site. Um, if that were to be offered through something like this, you know, having the ability to have that show up on the page is what that's there for. So um, take a lot of the preferences with a, with a grain of salt at this point. The idea is that repositories, when they want to know things, would uh, create a profile in our system that then guides what shows up in those preference pages so that the preferences that they have uh, show up. Um, the other thing is that the matchmaking results right now are, are pretty simple. They actually are live. They're looking at the content that you send so we can decide, you know, do you have formats that the repository does not want? Um, do you have MIME types that they don't uh, support in their archive? Um, is your data just really large compared to what they're willing to handle because they're on a, you know, an institutional repository that, that has limits? Um, all of those things, you're getting live answers back but there's not much of an explanation beyond you do or don't meet the requirement and a little bit of hint right now. Um, because we do have their full repository profiles, there's a lot more information about the general information about repositories that's available in those, in those, um, uh, in those profiles that we will be able to show uh, within the GUI. Um, there's a lot more that we could do to give you a better explanation of why you do or don't fit their, um, their uh, you know, their, their policies, their, their requirements and their preferences and what you can do about it. Um, and then just to, to point out as well, I think Anya uh, probably violated at least one rule when she was submitting. Um, the idea here is that, again, we're never going to stop you in software from pushing your data out so the repository can see it. And then if, it, if you don't meet the very pol policies as stated, um, you can then go into sort of human interaction mode and get a phone call or an email and kind of figure out um, you know, maybe made an agreement on the side that they'll take your data even though it's, you know, three bytes over the limit. Um, you guys can decide at that point. So these are still, as far as our, as far as seed software is concerned, are going to be recommendations to you and then it's up to the repositories um, as they do now to, to basically enforce their policy or find ways to come back into seed with you and change some of the metadata so that you fit it better, um, you know, anything they want to do. Well, Jim, I also wanted to go back to metadata and add uh, another uh, interesting new feature. So, uh, as in 1.5, uh, you can obviously add custom metadata terms. Um, and you can easily do it by going to this area. And, for example, I uh, recently added a couple new uh, uh, fields. But what's really uh, interesting and new in uh, 2.0 is that now you can link to external vocabularies. Uh, like, for example, this unit is looking, oh, sorry, uh, is looking at the external um, library of uh, values that are allowed if you pick this, this term. So if I go back to my uh, data set here and select units, I'll be choosing from a list of uh, possible values and um, I uh, that this uh, unit uh, 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 list been brought in by linking to that external vocabulary okay and I'm I'm trying to keep scanning through questions as they're coming into um, maybe I can keep trying to answer in general some of these um, one, one question is about the size of data sets and so on that we support, and I think um, right now um, probably the easiest thing to do is to tell you how big the data sets are that, that we published and are contemplating. Um, in theory, right, a lot of the, the technologies we're using are highly scalable and um, you know, in terms of the active spaces, and then when we publish things, we're really trying to do a good job of making sure that we can be efficient on large-scale storage um, to be able to, rather than spitting out hundreds of thousands of files that have to get archived somewhere, we can tar them and zip them up um, so that they, they form good packages that uh, uh, take up space but, but don't uh, 
don't bother HPC systems and cloud storage quite so much. So um, to date, we've published um, uh, more than 1.4, 1.5 terabytes of data. Um, the SEND group in particular is looking at uh, uh, individual data sets that may be on the order of a terabyte or more, not, not individual files, but packages of files to publish at once of a terabyte size and 10 to 50 terabytes. Um, those are things that you know we, we, we expect to be able to handle. Um, I think the biggest challenge is when you go beyond the tens of terabytes, um, uh, trying to find uh, storage for those at this point, you know, people who are willing to commit storage for the long term is, is where the biggest challenge is. And again, I, I think that's where um, you know, our answer is about as good as anyone in terms of, of trying to get uh, working with things like the National Data Service um, and organizations that are basically trying to figure out how to do this and, and basically provide such a service nationally. Um, and one more thought, and I've lost it. Um, yeah, um, sorry, and just, just the other metric for files, again, is that um, I think I mentioned before, you know, hundreds of thousands of files in a package. Um, we've already got multiple millions of files that are in active spaces. Um, you know, you can, you, can, uh, you can look at those kinds of sizes, and then again, uh, 2.0, if, if, uh, if we had Luigi drop in for, for, for more discussion, he could tell you about we're, we're basically using in 2.0 a lot of uh, horizontally scalable technologies that really mean that as use grows, um, it's, it becomes much more simple now in 2.0 for us to just keep adding machines to keep growing um, or to, to go on a cloud infrastructure and just kind of keep cloud scaling out. Um, but I won't, I won't go further into that here, but um, you know, Luigi can certainly tell you more and, and uh, we can go from there. Um, Anya, do you have a particular question? I'm going to go back to scanning the list. Uh, I'm actually having a little bit of difficulty uh, getting questions on my end here. <laughs> okay. um, I have a question about what is the el who is eligible to use the service. Um, again, we have a, a somewhat fuzzy answer there that right now we, we've uh, we're a cooperative agreement with NSF, and our commitment has basically been to put sustainability research data out. So I think if you qualify that way that this is real research data, um, we're willing to look at things from uh, the, the particular question was was Canada or elsewhere, right? Environmental and sustainability are international issues, so um, data that would be of interest to, to U.S. researchers because it's relevant to say sustainability would qualify as well. Um, as as we go forward and as other data services go forward, I think that's that's a big question for all of us is, you know, what are the qualifications? Um, when when do you impose those kinds of policies? Um, when do you, uh, do you, do you prefer observational data that can't be repeated over computational? Um, do you agree to take small data from anybody, but if it gets large, you know, have put some more constraints in place. Um, again, there, there are lots of forums, and to, to give a shout out to the other one that, that one of our uh, co-PIs, Beth Playley, is, is in the leadership of is the Research Data Alliance. You know, everybody who's in this space right now is facing these questions, and I think we're all, you know, trying to give reasonably good answers for now, um, trying to get people going, um, looking to, to influence the conversation for the longer term as to where these things go and, and come up with sustainable over time. Um, and so again, if, if you have a particular question about particular data sets, um, please contact us. Um, I think Anya and um, I as backup are good contact points. I don't know, Anya, did you have did you have the email address and things as well to was that part of your presentation to still uh, put yes, in? Uh, we're going to show the content information at the end. Okay, uh, okay. So, so Anya uh, will cover that, um, at the specifics of who to contact and how. Yeah. Um, we have a question on the release date for 2.0. Um, I think we're, um, we're shooting for later in the spring. Um, and the reason I, I say it without a, a firm date and a, a firm question here is that um, we've got a lot of active users in 1.5 who are relying on features that are there, and we're we're aware that we want to make sure that the transition is easy, and so we, we're potentially expecting that um, there are some users who want to start new who 
aren't relying on the old feature set that may be able to jump into 2.0 before we're able to fully transition everything that's going on in, in 1.5 over. So we may, um, we're contemplating whether we have basically a, a rollover date where everybody moves or do this in a more gradual thing where we start projects on 2.0 and we, we migrate 1.5 projects off. Um, we already have the basics of being able to move the data across in the metadata. Um, we've been basically populating our test spaces with some of the data from the, the 1.5 demo spaces. So a lot of the transition mechanism is in place at this point. And again, I think we're, um, we're waiting to see how well we get uh, 2.0 in place and uh, uh, then just kind of look at uh, where, where 1.5 users are and, and start working with the individual groups to decide when to transition over. Um, trying to see if I've missed any questions. I think that's it. I, I, let me uh, let me just ask our our internal folks and, and organizers here that uh, some of these questions I tried to answer by saying send to all. So I. Does that mean that my answers actually went out and people can read the answers that we haven't covered or should we be discussing them in audio? Yes, um, if you hit send to to all, everyone in the audience should be able to view them. Okay, so I'll just point out that if, you, if you've been looking at the slides and or the screen share and haven't looked at the question panel, there are questions that, that got answered there um, that, uh, uh, that I haven't talked about. Um, I, I do see one um, one more question about uh, the external vocabularies. Um, this is meant to be open, and again, um, part of what we wanted to do with SEED is to not mandate what vocabulary is right for your community or sub-community, or even that you should use the same vocabularies when you're doing different parts of your research. So the metadata definitions is really uh, meant to be open, and the idea is that you would plug in external vocabularies um, that make sense to you. Um, so the, the question includes the, the word Darwin core here. Um, basically, we're, we're um, getting set so that if you can get a list of Darwin core terms, uh, either available as a file or as a website, we'll be able to pull those in um, and, and be able to use them here. So um, the ones that are here, I don't know if it's worthwhile to, to uh, go to that URL at the bottom, but for example, the scientific units um, one at the bottom of the list here, um, the list at that website um, that, that you can see over towards the right is basically showing, uh, you know, meters per second, amperes, arc degrees, all of the kind of standard vocabularies, um, uh, you know, all the standard units that you might use in science that you can then associate with your data set. Um, we've talked with um, uh, Kawazi, who has the observational data model, um, we've used some of their terms in the past, even back in 1.5, but again, with all of this, um, we tend to use a lot of uh, basic Dublin Core type of information for bibliographic title, abstract, so on. Um, we're looking at, <coughs> at things like uh, ODM for just, you know, experimental method, observational sites, some of the basic things. But um, if you don't like these and you've got better ones in your subset of the community, um, you want more or less detail in some of these areas and you've got different terms for that, that's what this is meant for. Um, eventually on a, on a per project level that you can decide um, what the vocabularies are. I think that's all the questions that I've seen come in. Um, oh, one more with a, a question about the relationship to the, um, the research data surface at UIUC. Um, I'm not sure that I can answer that well here other than to um, point out that the, the people we have working on the ideals connections are at, at Illinois are the people who are involved in the research data service, as is the connection to NCSA down there. So um, I would refer you probably uh, offline to, to them to get more detail about how these things are coming together. Um, but but uh, I guess basically the, the, 
the answer I can give is that we're aware of each other and we're trying to make sure that we uh, we share at least lessons learned, if not um, if not going farther to uh, to be able to make some software bridges so that we can send data from seed in. Um, but I, I think any specific plans uh, um, or interests, I think I'll have to defer to the Illinois folks to answer. Okay. Um, are those all questions, uh, Jim? Can you see? For some reason, I only see like a small sample of questions. I'm not sure. Yeah, I eventually figured out how you can pull um, <laughs> pull the whole panel out, and then you can see it bigger. But okay. Um, well. Uh, yeah, I, I I think if if we missed any. Um, you know, I'll just give the the standard. You know, please contact us. Um, we're, you know, I, I hope our 1.5 users know that we're friendly people and we're really interested in getting real scientific data out and really solving problems for people. So, um, you know, don't hesitate to ask. Um, you know, people usually start their questions with a, you know, this may be a stupid question or I'm sorry to bother you, but that's what we're here for, right? We're trying to actually make a service that, that's the neat thing about DataNet in general and about the SEED project, I think, is we're really trying to push this all the way into something that is operational that you can use um, reliably and securely and get science done and publish your data in a way that you couldn't before. So, um, yep, so uh, exactly. Yeah. I was going to say, uh, yeah, uh, user feedback is what really drives the development and agenda and seed. So we are really interested in hearing your feedback, any comments, and obviously questions we'll be happy to answer after the webinar. So please send those to us. Uh, Seed's contact information is on your screen. Um, so, and uh, yeah, we'd like to hear if you feel like uh, something been uh, confusing or certain aspects that you wish were better. Uh, please don't hesitate. Let us know. Um, and if you're a new user out there, who would love to know, uh, we would love to know um, how you plan on using Seed and if there's anything uh, we can do to help you get started. Um, so, and uh, again, if there was a topic we went through too quickly or uh, there are any additional questions, uh, also send them, uh, those to us. Um, and if there's no any additional questions, um, uh, I also wanted to uh, thank uh, SEED's active users uh, who are attending today's presentation, uh, specifically the SAN group. Uh, thank you for your contribution to this project as you are often uh, the first to try uh, see new features and updates and we are very appreciative of your input, so thank you very much. Um, so, um, any additional questions appear, Jim? Uh, or, uh, I'll just iterate the thank you, and, um, and again, um, we, we look forward to working with uh, more of you in the future. Okay. Uh, yes. Uh, so with that, uh, we can end this uh, webinar. Thank you all, and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>